Hello everyone, my name is James Rangan and I am talking today about how you can enable and enhance your Windows 10 migration using the Absence suite of tools which is the desktop now and data now and also maybe even the Insight products that Absence actually provide as part of their product suite. Um, so a lot of people are talking about Windows 10 migration because it's on the horizon for everyone and everybody's quite keen to adopt the, the new security features of the operating system but also they really want to get on a supported operating system model you know a lot of people were caught out almost by the end of support for Windows XP so there was a lot of rushing as people put a lot of time and a lot of resource and a lot of money really into getting off Windows XP and onto the Windows 7 platform. So a lot of people are very conscious that 2020 is the actual deadline for Windows 7 support. So by then you'll have to have moved off to another operating system. And because Windows 8.1 wasn't particularly well received, then most people are thinking about moving to Windows 10. And the thing about Windows 10 is it introduces a servicing branch model. If you come into this video from the, the, the documentation that I've already done, you can see a, um, a more detailed discussion of that in there. But you have a, what's called the current branch for business and the long-term servicing branch model are the two servicing branch models that will be most popular with enterprises. Microsoft are quite keen to encourage people to adopt the current branch for business model, the CBB model, so that people will be kept very very aggressively up to date. Um, LTSB is recommended by Microsoft only in specific situations. So if you do adopt the current branch of business model, and I think most enterprises that I talk to are keen for most of their machines to go on the current branch of business model, not only do you have the issues of migrating from Windows 7 to Windows 10 and all the associated you know, things that you need to bring across in that situation, but you also have the thing that you're almost in a, a state of now perpetual migration. Microsoft have said there will be two or three what they call feature upgrades landing in each calendar year. Now they are essentially entire new copies of the Windows operating system. Now you could just do an in-place upgrade um, two or three times a year and preserve all of your user settings and data and whatnot. But a lot of people I've talked to aren't very keen on that idea. You know, you get a lot of incompatibility problems possibly device driver problems, errors, worst case scenario, you come along and you've got a security threat on one of the machines that you are then simply moving into the new um, feature upgrade, the new updated version of the operating system. So most people are keen to do a wipe and reload in these situations, which makes it even more important that you take the user's data and the user's, what we call the user personality, which are their settings, their configuration settings, their look and feel, to get these things moving between the machines. Because otherwise, you're going to be experiencing a lot of disruption, as I said, two or three times a year, and your users are really not going to be happy. Their user experience is going to suffer, their productivity is going to suffer. So just to demonstrate this, hopefully we're just going to do a quick and dead easy demonstration. I don't want to do anything at scale, obviously, because I'm just working in my lab, and there's not an awful lot of stuff uh, and a lot of resource available there. But just to quickly show you um, what I've got set up here within Hyper-V. Um, we've got the AppSense infrastructure running, so we've got an AppSense desktop now server running, which is this one here, which deals with the saving of the user personality, the user configuration settings, um, the look and feel, all that sort of thing. Application settings are done within that server. We also have an AppSense data now appliance sat here. This deals with saving and synchronizing the user data. Data now started out as an EFSS tool, which is an enterprise file share and synchronization tool, but it also has migration capabilities in there, which is something that possibly not a lot of people are particularly aware of. So that's what um, a part of this that we're going to highlight here today. I've got two domain controllers running, obviously for authentication purposes. I have my users base Windows 7 machine which is going to be migrated away from and then I have two new Windows 10 machines running this one 201 already has all the AppSense agents installed on it as part of the image this one here 204 does not have the AppSense agents on so we can show you what would happen without AppSense and then what will happen once we've configured AppSense ready to go so hopefully keep this nice and short for you so anyway we've got our user yeah we've got a user on our old windows 7 platform let's call that user jim for instance right so here's jim's windows 7 desktop fairly standard windows 7 desktop 
and we'll just log on to it. Let's have a look and see what sort of things Jim is kind of used to in his environment. Because what you forget is, you know, when you when you when you deal with users, um, you forget that, you know, even if you provide capabilities like redirected folders and things like that, the users don't always use all of these things. So what makes up the user's personality? What makes up the experience that Jim is used to having on here? Right. So straight away we can see he's got a custom background on his desktop, which is fair enough, and. Um, He's also got shortcuts on his desktop in a particular arrangement. So he's got a redirected documents folder. Now Jim's quite a, a, a decent um, user, as users go. And he's storing all of his stuff in the documents folder. So he's got all of his, uh, doc, most of his documents in there. He's also created a shortcut on the desktop to his documents folder, just to make it easier to find, which is fair enough. But he's also got some sort of user guide on the desktop that he references quite a lot. So that's almost, um, you know, he keeps most of his stuff in the documents folder, but he's failed a little bit there because he's put that on there. And that's quite vital to his um, day to day work. So he's got it popped on the desktop. He's also got a few shortcuts to the control panel and whatnot over this side on the right hand side, but also what Jim's done if you click on this shortcut here, he's got a lot of samples of, I don't know what, but these are documents that are, are vital to him. And for whatever reason, he stored these in a subfolder of his user profile called samples. And he's created a shortcut to it on the desktop. And as I say, whatever reason he chose for doing that, whether he was told to by a support guy, whether it's just something he did, maybe the files were a bit big or something like that. They, these files are not inside his redirected folder. So that's a, a little bit of an issue right there. So he's also got a few pinned items, Outlook and Remote Desktop and stuff like that on his taskbar. He's got a few pinned items on the Start menu itself as well. So that's what makes up Jim's user personality and data. That's everything that he would expect to have on there. So how do we go about getting these things off into... Um, the Windows 10 environment ready for Jim to migrate. I forgot to mention Jim's got a couple of other little things that he relies on as well with actually within the applications as well for instance in Excel he's created a few quick access toolbar shortcuts which just sit at the top of the screen here you can see those so again those are things that he relies on he might even rely on most recently used lists and things like that but that's the the user person that we're going to cover. So first of all what you do when you're using the AppSense tools is you need to put the actual agents on the machine. So this is across to our AppSense server. And we will install the agents on this machine. You can do this via SCCM or Alteris or you do it via group policy. You could manually install them. When the event you don't have those things, the actual AppSense server itself has what's called the management center, which is what we're looking at at the moment. And you use this for deploying packages. Now, this is the desktop now server, but it also is going to deploy the data now agent onto that machine. So we're going to drop um, an environment manager agent and a data now agent and an environment manager config onto there. So hopefully we should see that this machine will automatically install these agents and then it'll go off and reboot. Obviously, in an enterprise environment, you wouldn't want to reboot machines straight away when you do the deployment. That's just literally what we're going to pop on there so let's just see if those agents all install and reboot and then we'll go off and do a test on Windows 10 okay we just managed to quickly sort some well, say quickly sort some firewall issues out there um, I don't know what I'd managed to do in my lab but I'd brought my firewall JPLs as you can see now the machine has checked in for the agents and it's now telling me that a restart will occur in two minutes so what we'll do we'll restart Jim's Windows 7 machine over there so that's now off installing the AppSense data now and desktop now urgents just get rid of that that's those errors that Jim's getting a log off is something that possibly we want to avoid turning over to his new Windows 10 desktop there you see there it's configuring those AppSense updates so we said we had two Windows 10 machines yeah so we had 201 which has got already got the AppSense agents on it but we had 204 which doesn't so Assuming um, we were kind of like a, a, an overstretched, under-resourced admin, and we basically thought, oh yeah, Jim will have put all of his documents into his redirected my documents folder, that'll take care of all his data, and we'll just migrate them across. 
and his data will be there. So what would happen in that situation? So here's our new Windows 10 desktop. So our user Jim says, there's your shiny new Windows 10 desktop, Jim. Go and log on. So he logs on for the first time, and the first thing you will notice is that it takes a very long time to log on. But what we're going to observe is maybe, you know, all of the things that he relies on aren't there. And just a quick word, um, you know, we identified um, on Jim's Windows 7 desktop that he had data in non-standard areas and he had a bunch of configuration settings that he relied on. How would you discover these sort of things for the users? Now, um, Insight is a tool from AppSense that can help you do this because it tells you where users are writing data to. So you can go through that, filter out everything that's in the user profile or the... Uh, in the My Documents area of the profile or any of your redirected folders and look for anything, particularly things that are on secondary drives or subfolders of the user profile that aren't covered by folder redirection, things like that. It's not just the only tool in this space, the things like SysTrack, um, NextThink, FlexAira, Liquidwell, Abstratsphere, they can all do similar things, but if you're already an AppSense customer, Insight's a, a, a natural progression. It's also quite a, a sort of fairly cheap and easy setup way of getting this. So if you've got no visibility in this at all, and by all means, you can use Insight as well to find out where your users are writing your data. And with regards to configuration settings, Desktop now has a number of pre-built sort of templates that let you capture user data from things like the Microsoft Office Quick Access Toolbar and things like that. So it's a ne um, more or less what you need to know from a user config, a user personality perspective is what applications are they using, you know. And once you know what applications you're using, which you can also find out from Insight, Basically, you then feed that in, capture the applications through desktop now, capture the user profile settings, and off you go. Right, so you can see Jim um, has logged onto this Windows 10 machine here, and straight away we're going, oh god, I haven't got my desktop background, um, I haven't got my stuff on the desktop, oh no, where's where's my where's my samples folder and my, my, my guide that I had on the desktop, where are they? So he quickly has a look around, and you know, he's thinking, where, well, where's my documents folder, I had a shortcut to that, where is it now? So he's going looking in there, File Explorer, and um, oh, there's documents. Oh, well, there are some of my documents, but where are the other ones? Where, where, where are the other documents that I had? And, you know, where where are my applications? Where do I find things? It's, it's all very confusing. Where are the pinned items I had on the Start menu? And the taskbar. So straight away, your user is in a very confused state. He's quite annoyed, really, because he's been migrated. He's told he's going to this great new Windows 10 platform, and he's got his documents. And he can't find anything. Now, the, the, there's kind of three main areas that a user will look for. There are their applications. Obviously, they want their applications. They want to be able to launch those. There are their data. They want to be able to find their data, their documents, their spreadsheets, their PDFs, everything they rely on. They also want the bridge between the applications and the data, which is the file type association. So if you're working with your data, you want to be able to click a document, and it opens up where you'd expect it to. Um, so, for instance, um, we saw on Jim's desktop that he had things associated with um, with Foxit Reader for PDFs. So, we've got any PDFs in here? No, we haven't. That's really not. Oh, yes, we have. There you go. So, if he double clicks on a P one of the PDFs in here, it opens up in Microsoft Edge, which again is a very unfamiliar experience for our user and something that's you know not going to contribute to good user experience and his acceptance of this new platform. Um, that should eventually open up in Edge, one would think. But anyway, we've just proved that the file type association is indeed with Edge rather than with anything else. So let's just close that down if it wants to let us. So, as you say, our user is, he's not happy. He's not a happy bunny. Now, if you've got hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of users, if you don't do this sort of preparation, then you're going to, ex you know, that sort of thing is going to be multiplied ad infinitum. So let's just log the user off here. Now, I'm well aware that people do migrations and they have these things like the user step migration tool and custom scripts and things like that to achieve this. But with Windows 10, because as I said earlier, you're moving on to this perpetual migration sort of scenario, you're going to have to be constantly tuning those USMT XML files or those custom scripts and things like that and constantly moving them with the way your user's needs change. And it's going to become almost a full-time job with the, the massive overhead of maintenance and resource. And because Windows 10 rolling upgrade cadence means that you have to do a lot more um, 
you have to do a lot more testing and remediation of your applications. Anyway, the last thing you want is to get stuck in this whole thing of maintaining all these custom scripts and XML files to maintain your migration process. So really, a tool of some sort that helps out in this way is probably quite vital. So let's switch back to our Windows 7 original machine here that Jim was on, and hopefully, I'll just quickly check the apps. <laughs> it's console. You can see now it has got all the packages on there, the data now agent, the desktop now agents as well. So that's all good. So let's log Jim back on. And this is his, his, his source desktop. So, you know, we've had a, a, an abortive run at his Windows 10 migration. So now we're going to try and do it a bit better. So let's get him logged on again. Right, so first of all, it's asking him to log into data now, which he'll only have to do once, hopefully. You can configure this with single sign on, but I wasn't. Uh, I'll just forget the password, right? Possibly. Let's just try that again. If I can even switch my focus back properly. It's really embarrassing when you. I don't think I've ever gone through a video yet. Password right. There we go. Logged in this time. So if you remember, we um, mentioned that we'd identified these non-standard areas in the user's profile. This sort of samples area here and his stuff on the desktop. What we've done is we've actually fed those into the group policy object that controls data now, and we've literally just defined them here. In a list, they literally just point to a, a, a multiple value string in the registry. I've configured them under a subfolder called data now hidden because I'm redirecting them to the home drive because it's just a fairly simple setup and I didn't want the user to get um, confused by seeing multiple copies, so I've just took them away in a hidden folder. But that should all start synchronizing itself nicely together now. Okay, now we can see overlays are appearing on here. So we say the stuff we've got configured to capture on the desktop is getting overlays on it which you can turn off if you want to but right now they're indicating to us that those files are synchronizing up to the 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 the, the network location that we've configured and if we look in this folder of samples you can see those as well have all synchronized off up to the user's um network area so that's brilliant as far as we're concerned now what you can do with this is it allows you basically to um you know, you don't have to have a specific trigger point for migration. You don't say, we need to get this user done by X point, because that's why he's been migrated. So if you've got users with great big data files, for instance, think about an Outlook PST file, you can do things like that with um, data now as well. You can say, configure it to do that silently in the background, to be uploading that file, and then when it's ready, mark the user as ready for migration, and you can migrate them whenever you want. It can be added to a ready list. And of course, if the user then makes further changes to those files in the meantime, it's synchronized straight up there, just the Delta. So it's an excellent way of doing this. Now, also what we have configured on the desktop now server to um, capture stuff for the user in our, what's called the personalization server aspect. And I'll have to reconnect this because I had to reboot the server to get rid of that little firewall issue that we had, but that was something to, um, specific to my lab. Unfortunately, for some reason it had um, adopted a public network, which Windows machines do occasionally do that. Anyway, we've configured on our migration personalization group here. It's going to capture settings for a bunch of applications, uh, basically just Office at the minute, because that's all we've got um, the, the users configured in there, but you would add everything into there. And we've configured a bunch of Windows personalization settings. These all come out of the box. We're capturing things like the start menu, the mail profile, IE cookies, um, Explorer settings, desktop settings, all of that is there ready as a template. You just turn them all on, and it's going to drag all of this in when Jim logs off. So Jim now is logged onto this machine. He's been told he's ready for migration this time. So what he's going to do is he's all his data is synchronized up. So as he logs off, we should see it communicating with the personalization server. Um, literally should just uh, serving personalization data or something like that. Just get rid of these errors. Hopefully when we migrate Windows 10, those errors will have gone. So we just watch here, it's saying running log off actions at the minute. We should hopefully just briefly see it reporting that it's communicating with the personalization server. And of course it takes forever, doesn't it? When you sat here recording a video, as is usually the way. I 
I haven't actually got any log off actions configured, so I don't know why it's turned that long. But I did notice that the performance on my Windows 7 desktops in the lab has become quite dire recently. Um, and I think it's something to do with the changes Microsoft have made to the update processes since Windows 10 came along. You know, a very big cumulative update models constantly raining down on Windows 7 machines and if I had my single hat on, there you go, serving user personalization now so that is taking all of the users at Microsoft Office settings and other application settings if you had them configured and all their operating system settings are now being synchronized off into an SQL database but yeah I think it's a bit, bit cynical really that Microsoft are, are forcing Windows 7 machines to severely underperform compared to what they used to do so if we just quickly do what's called a personalization analysis, which you may or may not be familiar with, um, we should see if we just click display that, that our user now has data in there. So he's got all of this stuff in there. Most of it's all desktop-y sort of stuff, um, but it's saved off his data settings as well. So that's all super duper. So we can now go and um, shut down his Windows 7 machine. Because we believe he is ready to be migrated across to a Windows 10 machine. And which one was it that had the AppSense agents on? Let's quickly just check. It was 201, as we see there. That one's got the AppSense agents and configuration already installed. So it should be all ready to rock on this one. So let's just have a look. Switch our user over. You'll see it hasn't brought across the user's profile picture because it can't do that until the user actually logs on, which is a bit a bit kind of annoying. That's actually stored in Active Directory anyway, so not to worry too much uh, about that one. So let's just log this user on and see what we shall see. Alright, so let's <coughs> log our user, Jim, into his new Windows 10 image with the full AppSense agents on and see, um, see what we get. Straight away, you can see we have our background, we have our stuff on the desktop, we have our icon arrangement, we have pinned items on the taskbar, which is excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, now is running and synchronizing. We have his shortcuts on the start menu and do we actually have Yep, we have all of our PDF files in there. Um, we don't have the file type association, which is a bit annoying because Edge is normally quite aggressive at overriding this. So what we have to do is a teensy bit of user intervention here. So it's not completely and utterly flawless. File type associations are very, very difficult. Um, to manage but as you say once we've got that in there that's the one thing that we couldn't actually get across there um, the only bit that we had any real difficulty well, um, with was actually the quick access toolbar settings from Excel now normally these are dead 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 straightforward as you can see it's come across um, logged him in and brought his colour scheme but we managed to get these across most of them anyway but the difference is they used to be what were called QAT files they literally sat in a folder for the quick access toolbar and they were portable between versions but because we've gone from 2007 and migrated across to 2016 they've actually changed the way um, they're now called dot office ui files that control the quick access toolbar so it was an architectural change behind the scenes what we did we had to do a bit of scripting to get around that and share the settings between them but compared to the disruption that the user had literally um what we've had to do is reset a file type association that is the only disruption they've had and possibly we could have dealt with that with a bit more scripting inside of desktop now but there you go there's the user logged in you can see his date is all synchronized he's got his shortcut to his documents folder in there he's got that samples folder that was outside of the normal user profile location now that could have been anywhere that could have been on a um, you know on, on a different drive on the machine or anything like that so all that can be brought across he's got his familiar icon range his familiar background familiar shortcuts and all of that is provision. Look, he's even got his little thing now. Um, I don't understand. I think that comes down just when the user logs on. It creates the profile. It brings across the user profile picture out of Active Directory. 
or it might even um, possibly does it in desktop now as well um, can't be exactly sure about that yes it does it is desktop now doing it it's not active directory it's but because until the user was logged on that couldn't actually be put down there so that's just an another little example I didn't even configure that specifically that has just popped across because desktop now in its default operating system settings configuration just grab that so that's all just absolutely fantabulous the user is now ready to rock a little bit of training is absolutely ready to go and I think that's absolutely fantastic now you times this sort of migration by a hundred by a thousand by ten thousand a hundred thousand users and the amount of time that you've served in support resource by doing this is amazing but the thing also is as well that now when six months down the line when we have to do all of this again we have to do another wipe and reload we've got all of this stuff covered we've got the data and the user personality covered through desktop now and data now and insight as well if you want to use that to give you a little bit of ins um, insight as it were <laughs> into what the users are doing if you don't have another technology that can do that and so your teams just need to concentrate on your applications the data and the user personality is covered what you need to concentrate on is the applications are the applications going to work and are we going to be able to provision them to the new version of windows and that is a massive possibly a 60 70 percent reduction in the windows 10 delivery process that you're going to have to go through um i hope that has been uh, fairly useful um for you out there and um hopefully it complements the, the 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 work i've been doing on a on a document about this perfectly but even if you're coming to this completely cold hopefully that'll show you how the AppSense tools the data now tool desktop now tool and the insight tool can all make your migration to windows 10 just a hell of a lot smoother for your users um thank you for listening i hope that has been useful <laughs>